Thank you very much, Reef Catchments, for giving me the opportunity um, to present at your forum and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, uh, we're going to have a bit of a change of pace now. Um, I understand there may be some questions later on, but be prepared. I'm also going to ask you some questions as well. I've got to get away from this lectern because it's hiding me. Oh, that's right, I'll stand. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Um, so my presentation this afternoon is about um, cattle nutrition. I'm focusing on the Mackay region, um, but it also spills over into other areas as well. Now, talking about cattle nutrition in less than an hour is almost impossible. Um, when we run workshops, we take three days, but we could take five days, two weeks, depending on how detailed you want to get. Um, so this is an overview of what I'm going to cover. Um, but I, I trust you will appreciate um, that this is... Um, I'm only going to skim over these topics and there won't be time to get into detail or solutions in general, particularly for individuals. I'm also going to touch on some um, slides, put some slides up there with solutions, nutritional solutions, which may not be palatable to everyone. We're not saying that everything we put up is everybody's cup of tea, but I've also been asked this afternoon to touch on the animal welfare issue. Now, animal welfare is a big topic. Nutrition is only part of the story in terms of addressing animal welfare. And if we address nutrition, um, then the part of animal welfare that's a problem in relation to nutrition, we should um, solve that problem. So please understand that um, you may not need to go to some of these places, but indeed some people will need to, should have done last year, may need to this year to address animal welfare. Okay, so first off, what nutrients are important? What nutrition does the pasture supply? We've had a, a dose of that already. How do you assess the quality of the diet that cattle are actually eating? What, what about animal status? Can we get some information from animal status that will give us an idea of the deficiencies in the diet? What about managing those gaps? Now, that's a big topic that uh, we can't really cover on this afternoon, but we just skim. What's the rainfall outlook? What was the rainfall outlook this time last year? Can anyone tell me? Quite good? No good? Can anyone remember exactly what it was? What was the chance of achieving, say, median rainfall up until July. Does anyone remember? Average to low. Okay, so we will just look at that towards the end as well. Now, today is the day that the bomb um, site was to upgrade their forecasts, their outlooks. So I managed to get some of that information, but not all of it. Okay, so we have to touch on managing nutrition in a dry year as well. Okay. So, I'm going to put it back to you now. Grab your pens. I want you to write down something in a minute. Let's say, let's focus on human nutrition. There's been a bit of talk about that in the last presentation. You're going on a road trip or a driving trip for some older people who might relate to that. You're going to be away for a week. You've got little space, no fridge, no shops. What are you going to take with you? Now I'm going to give you some options and beer is not one of them. Okay, so you can take potatoes, you can take rice, start writing, you can take meat, preferably beef, yeah, you can take bananas, avocados, vitamin K2 and vitamin C. Okay. Just quickly, you can only take three items with you and you've got to survive a week. What are you going to take? Can anyone tell me? 
we got there? Oranges? Yeah? How about some vitamin C? Okay. Righto. Let's say you're allowed to add one thing that's not on my list. Okay, has anyone got a list they can give me? They're going to take. Good choice. Can you tell me why? Good, good fats in... Yep, carbohydrate. Okay. So can anyone else highlight for me what's in avocados? Healthy fats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now we're starting to do that important thing called planning. So that's good. Okay. Has anyone else got another list? Sorry, what was that? Okay. So a vegetarian, a vegan. Oh, good. Okay. So what about the other people in the car? <laughs> Radio. That's the bit I didn't tell you. Okay. So that was just a little exercise to get us thinking about nutrients. Okay, so what do you think about that? Okay, so we, we really... We don't know if that balance is any good, really, because we don't know what's in the bread. But okay, but it it looks a bit out, doesn't it? So right. And just on that note, my lunch was a bit out. Okay, so I had to put in an order for some carbs. So I'm a celiac, so I didn't get any bread, etc. But thank you very much to the MEC for supplying that extra nutrient for me at lunchtime. Okay, so these are the nutrients that cattle are, that cattle need and we're talking about the same nutrients basically that we need. So if we start to think about the nutrients we need, reflect on the nutrients cattle need, uh, we have gone part of the way to understanding what needs to be in their diet for appropriate quality. However, of course, last year you were told that they have a different digestive system. Um, so things are going to be a little bit different and they're eating a different diet. What about the quantities of those nutrients? So we need to keep in mind what they need most of and it's energy. And they need a lot of protein just like we do. Hence the gentleman up the back was right on to it. We need energy, carbohydrates, we need some protein, good fats, but we also need some minerals as well, as do they. We need some trace elements and we need some vitamins as well. So when we're talking about cattle, in terms of protein, if we're talking about a lactating cow, she may need between 850 and 950 grams of protein, depending how big she is. If we come down that triangle, she only needs between 8 to 10 grams of phosphorus in the wet season, depending on her size and her status and what sort of country type she's on, etc., etc. If we come down further to the pointy end of the food pyramid, we're talking about trace elements, she may only need 7 to 10 milligrams of copper. So we've gone from grams in the hundreds down to 8 to 10 grams down to milligrams. So we have to keep this in perspective um, with cattle. So that doesn't mean to say that if they need something in milligrams, they're not going to become deficient in it. And we have seen deficiencies on the coast around Kai in some of those nutrients where they need milligrams. But don't get hung up on silver bullets, on the things that they need in small quantities and expect to get a big production response in normal circumstances. It's not going to happen. Right, so what nutrients does the pasture supply? This is a, 
the general topic that we're on. So what nutrients or what's in plant cells that's also in animal cells? Can anyone tell me? Potentially, yes. Protein, yes. Yep, anything else? Okay, so we've got the same sort of things, the same sort of nutrients. We've got carbohydrates and fats. So cattle um, get structural and non-structural carbohydrates from plants. The structural ones contain the simple sugars and starches. That's what we're interested in. They get proteins, which they form into long-chain fatty acids, amino acids. They get minerals. What's missing from that list? Okay, so the vitamins. So generally cattle can synthesise vitamins. The rumen microbes in their gut can synthesise their own vitamins. So unless there's a drought or something like that, they should be fine. So what does a pasture need to provide the nutrition for cattle? So plants will use the sun's radiation and through the process of photosynthesis and chemical reactions and produce carbohydrates, proteins, etc., which the animals then go on and use. So the bigger the leaf area of a plant, the more chance there is of that happening and using solar radiation. So that's just a link to something about the plants that need to be in the diet. Okay. Let's drill down and look at actual plants. So there's been a lot of talk today about soil health, some talk about plant species. There's something else that affects the diet quality or the nutrient value of a plant, and that's its age. So early, just point, so early in the gro great growth of a plant, in this case, we'll look at grasses. In the early phase one, there's a lot of green leaf, short green leaf, and they're very digestible. However, they're also susceptible to overgrazing because they've drawn carbohydrate stores from their roots during that time, so we have to be careful. But as, as, as grasses, grasses age, they rapidly decrease in digestibility. If we look at legumes, their decrease in digestibility as they age is less. So legumes are useful later in the season um, because they hold their digestibility better. Although you will see cattle chewing the very tips of legumes at the moment. Um, also legumes are usually higher in protein and hold their protein con content better, whereas that of grasses decreases rapidly also depending on the conditions. If you look at an actual plant, the age of a plant, and we look at leaf compared to stem, then of course the leaf component is going to be more digestible and hold its digestibility as it ages, whereas the stem, the stem with an increase in cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin is going to be less digestible. So what that tells us then is that we need plants with a high leaf to stem ratio. So that means that we need plants that are palatable, digestible, productive, perennials. We need legumes. So this is just reinforcing some of the things that have already been talked about. But we need to make sure that animals can select a diet where they can select leaf over stem. Um, so that's the grazing management. Now that seems very obvious, but you'd be... Uh, it's, it's not hard to end up with a situation where animals are actually forced to eat a plant that's less digestible over another plant or a plant part that's less digestible. Um, so we have to be very careful um, in our grazing management systems that we watch what's happening. The other thing which has also been talked about today 
is stocking rates. So those three P grasses, we can easily reduce the proportion of those in the pasture through overgrazing. And I'm sure you've seen graphs like that before. So, um, and that's what's happening in a lot of pastures. Is there's, and particularly um, last year, a lot of pastures uh, got a bit of hammering because it didn't rain for a long time. Um, so now we can see that a lot of undesirable species have moved in. And, and if you're observing various, various paddocks as you drive along on your way to home or wherever, you'll see that, that happening. And you may also see it in your own um, pastures as well. So there's another thing that we need to consider, though, on top of all this. So up until we haven't been talking about anything new but this is a concept that might be a little bit new, but it's really important to grasp. And that is that there's a relationship between intake and diet quality. Um, in the back of your mind, you will understand this because we measure intake in terms of percent body weight. And you will understand that cattle in a feedlot, for example, might eat up to 3% of their body weight. But on a low quality diet, they might be eating 1.2%. So we've got a real problem here. We want the total diet to be of value. So a big thing controlling that is intake. And on top of that, the diet quality. So it's not just about how much energy is in the diet, um, how much protein, how much phosphorus, the actual proportions or the percentage, percentages. Um, and also how balanced it is, but what, what, what is the intake like? So we have a double whammy effect. So when the feed quality is poor, oops, and something's happened to my, something's happened to my, um, they're different on my computer, but basically, just forgive me for that. Um, as feed quality goes down, diet quality goes down, Intake goes down and production goes down. So it's the same. Um, if production is up, that means that diet quality is up, intake's up. So basically, the issue, though, that we face every dry season, though, is as diet quality decreases because it hasn't rained or whatever or the grazing management is not right, um, then intake also decreases and production decreases. But we, in actual fact, we, they need to get more nutrients, so it would be good if intake could go up, but they physically cannot eat it. So an example is if you're weaning and you feed, say, a brick of grassy, loosened hay, a little weaner will be able to eat that brick in a day. However, if you give that weaner um, some poor quality hay, say, instead of eating three kilos of hay, that weaner then needs to eat seven or eight kilos. And because of its size, and it can't eat any more than 3%, and with that level of diet quality, it's not going to, it's gonna be more like 1.5%, it can't physically eat enough to get the same level of nutrients. So this is what we face each and every dry season. And it's why we then have to take, in some cases for animal welfare, Reasons, other measures. Okay, let's impose an animal on the situation now. And I'm very worried about some of my, that my, some of my uh, inserts here might be out of whack. Okay, there's never really straight lines in anything biological, but this is an old graph and it's just stylized. So just keep that in mind. We've got a, a breeder, her calf is weaned. She has a dramatic drop in her need. So she might drop from 97 megajoules of energy by 40 megajoules of energy. Um, and then she needs to put on weight again though because we want her to be pregnant. She's pregnant back here somewhere. As pregnancy increases, she might need 62 megajoules of energy and then just before calving, she might need, say, 77 megajoules of energy. 
And then from once she calves, she has a large requirement for lactation. She might need 97 megajoules of energy. So in here, even though she's not lactating anymore, we still want her to put on weight because it's going to drop off her when it comes back up here, particularly if there's a gap in the feed. So that graph, that may not look like what it ha happens at your place. I don't know. So when we do the breeding edge workshop, we talk a lot about mating management systems and trying to sort out what is the best mating management and timing of reproduction for your place. We actually get you to do this in detail for your place. So we've got this problem in this particular situation because her peak lactation, which might be up here somewhere, may not necessarily match production point. Um, it's not too bad in this situation, but the questions you should be asking is what's happening at my place? So what happens last year? It didn't rain until later, so we've got a bigger problem. Or you might have organised carving so that it's too early, so we've got triple the problem. So this is one of the biggest issues as beef producers that we face. So we need to try and somehow match peak lactation with what we call production point. However, we've got a problem in the Mackay region in that we may not want little baby calves being subjected to heavy torrential rain. So that's something that you have to, to work through. So what do cattle become deficient in? If we, we're saying that there's a nutritional gap at the end of the year, hopefully not earlier, depending on the year, what do cattle become deficient in? And up there, I've got in the dry season, protein, energy and phosphorus. So if we live over the range at Nebo or Collinsville or Bowen, out west or in the, in the dry areas, it's almost certainly going to be protein first in most cases. However, on the coast and in the wet tropics, it could be protein first, it could be energy first, or it could be both first. So how do we know that? We know that through analysis of the diet that cattle have actually eaten uh, in a large research project that we actually did. So it just means that you have to address both. In the wet season, it's like making a cake. We've got plenty of energy, plenty of protein, but phosphorus might be limiting. Or if you're in a deficient area on the coast, it might be copper or selenium. So let's just put the wet season ones aside for a moment and let's just look at this dry season situation. And remember, I'm only skimming here. So in a workshop, we go into this in a lot more detail. So you have to ask yourself the question, what nutrients are primarily limiting performance? Because until you fix those, um, if you feed something else, some other nutrient, it may have little or no impact and you may waste your money. So here's the barrel concept, which some of you might have seen before. And in this instance, clearly protein is what's limiting performance. If we don't fix the protein problem, then you, putting energy into the system is not going to make a difference. So everyone in this room may, not, may know that and think, well, yes, that's common sense. But the carters of molasses last year, both carters that I came across, carriers of molasses, told me that there's still a lot of molasses being fed without any protein. Okay. So that can actually be counterproductive at the end of the day. And those people might be asking, well, it's going to rain. If I put urea in molasses, then I'm going to have a problem. Not if it's mixed properly. You won't have a problem. So if we want to have a cost-effective supplementation program, we have to address the first limiting nutrient first. So if we affect fix a protein problem, we still might have an energy problem and a phosphorus problem. 
So that's a principle, an important principle that we need to keep in mind. But what, what about the diet quality in general and assessing that? So they are all the things that you're looking at. Yes, some people are very pasture focused, some people are very cattle focused, but you need to be both. You need to know what's happening with your pasture, whether it's been driven, what it's been driven by, is there too many cattle, has, has it not been, had a spell. Um, but what about the cattle? What do they look like? What are they telling you? Are they, do they have a depraved appetite? Have you seen bone chewing or any other behaviour? What do they look like? How are they performing? What's their growth rate? How many calves are you getting? How many conceptions are you getting in the first six weeks of joining? All those sort of things. So, yes, you are grass managers, but you need to be cattle managers as well. And particularly from an animal welfare point of view, it's something that we, we can't ignore. So that was at our place in June last year. Uh, not very happy there because uh, we got a frost in June. It's less than 10 kilometres from the coast. And uh, we thought, right, we're, we're buying into country. We're out of the frost now. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, the bloke that sold us the place didn't tell us that. But anyway. Um, yeah, so we had a frost... And clearly, that's a big change in diet quality. Looking at the cattle, assessing body condition score. So some of you will probably be familiar with this, but it's something that you need to do all the time because maybe there's an intervention that needs to, to take place. And maybe that intervention is just because you need the performance down the track. A cow starts preparing for her next pregnancy during her current pregnancy. So if we look at reproductive loss and wastage, along the reproductive timeline, it goes back a lot further than you think. Some of the decisions that you make can't be reversed. If you make a poor decision that affects body condition of a breeder now, you're still going to be paying for that decision next year and the year after. And that's one of the things that we go into more detail in the workshop. So commonly one to five system, but if you find yourself starting to use 2.5s, 3.5s, etc., maybe you should be using a nine system. So as cattle people, you get really tuned into this. But you need to look at individual animals. Yes, you need to look at the whole mob, for sure, and what's the average of the mob. But you also need to look at individual animals. What's the worst cow in the mob look like? So that, so that was ours at a point last year. And what's her story? What was her story? Why does she look like that? Because she's older. She weaned a big calf the year before, but she got back in calf straight away. She's got a shorter gestation length, so she was lactating before all the other cows. So her gestation length was about two weeks shorter than what you'd expect. So she's got a story, but... She's a highly productive cow. It didn't rain for a period of last year, but um, we had to look after her and we, had to, we started to look after her, obviously, before she got to this point. So what affects body condition score? A lot of those things that have already been discussed today, including the fertility of the soil, the plant species. What about your land condition? Okay. There's been talk about carrying capacity assessments, but if your land condition is changing, then maybe those carrying capacity assessments need to be redone and upgraded. Okay, stocking rates. Uh, where you're located, what are the land systems, uh, what are the plant species, and what's your grazing management? So right now, all of us are looking at our breeders and we're assessing what their body condition score is now. So some breeders are still paying for last year and will still be paying for last year for a while. So those are things that are going to affect body condition score on our breeders right now. What were they like at the end of the dry season before it started raining? 
What time, when did they carve? Did they carve earlier? Does that mean they're lactating for longer? Did they get enough phosphorus over the wet season? Or have they been stripping fat and muscle off their back because they've had in, inadequate phosphorus? So they still might be producing a good wiener, but their stripping condition because their phosphorus status was below par. What about at the end of the dry season? So it's similar things, but if there's a big dip in diet quality and they didn't get the necessarily uh, nutrition, um, then that's going to affect the end of dry season body condition score. So we just have to accept maybe there's some years where they do need to get a, a higher level supplement than other years. Okay. So managing the pasture diet quality, these are all things that have already been mentioned. So we're looking at the quality, the quantity, stocking rates, whether the paddock's been rested, it's a term used today, or spelled, what time that happened, did it happen in time? What about the paddock rotation? Yes, we're trying to get as much um, you know, use out of the pasture as, as we can but were cattle in a paddock for too long? Did that affect their diet quality? Did it start up here and then did it do a bit of a dive? Were they still able to select a palatable diet? And, and in doing so, if diet quality, say, in the park grass portion did go down, is some herbs or forbs there that they might have tried to um, fill their diet with? So cattle are very good at selecting a diet that will give them, make them feel satisfied, um, that, will, that is digestible, so they want to fill up as quickly as possible and go lay, lay down and ruminate. What if we still got a dietary deficiency? We've got animals in our care, so we have an obligation to make sure that they get fed properly. We have an obligation to make sure that they don't lose a lot of weight or, or become sick, uh, end up with a depraved appetite or actually have an illness of some sort. So as cattle managers and owners, that's our obligation. So we still need to ask this question. Even though we've got everything right, we still need to ask this question, is there a deficiency in the diet? So what if we want to assess for deficiencies. Yes, we can look at the pasture and what cattle are doing, etc. But let's say we want to get a more accurate, uh, more accurate information. If we want more accurate information on energy and protein, then we can take a dung sample and send it away and get it assessed. We can assess animal status for phosphorus, selenium and copper as well. Okay. So let's start putting some figures. We can look at the pasture and what that shows is down the left-hand side you've got percent digestible and that drops as the pasture ages. But we start now starting to add some figures to that on the right-hand side. So we're actually talking about medials of metabolizable energy, which is what the animal uses. So once we get down to very low percent digestibility, the intakes are going to drop markedly. So we need... So if we have this information, if we actually have this information and we know the requirements, say for a lactating cow of 400 kgs, we can say on this percent digestibility, her intake's going to be here. But her requirements are here. So until we have an inf some information, without that, we can't really make an informed decision. The same goes for the diet quality in terms of protein. We know it's high. In the early phases of growth, when the grass is very green, there's lots of nitrogen, and we know that it's dropped off. But if we actually have the information, then we can do something about it. Okay, so assessing for crude protein and digestibility, we can grab a dung sample, we can send it away uh, and, and get it assessed. So it's, you've probably heard of it, it's near infrared reflectance spectroscopy or NIRS has come from the human health industry, they beam light through it 
use calibration equations, measure uh, the chemical components that we're actually interested in and we can get an idea of dry matter digestibility and percent protein. So we may want to do this because it might tell us in terms of those dietary gaps what's actually happening and we might because cattle will select out a diet um, that will give them the best uh, diet quality, but we may not know what's going on. Okay, so here's some of the figures um, that you get back. So this is an example. Obviously, this was part of research that, that I was involved in, and it's... it's Debesi out at Huonan, which is a different land type that you'd be familiar with. But it's a good example to show you that each year is going to be different. So these two years didn't really look that different, but in terms of what the, the diet the cattle were eating, it was quite different. So here the diet quality dropped off at a reasonably slow rate after the wet season. The green dots are the non-grass, and it's really interesting that the Crude protein levels follow the non-grass to a certain extent. The following wet season got quite a bit of rain for in January and there was a real spike in the crude protein, but then it didn't rain and the crude protein levels dropped off. So it actually probably became deficient in protein earlier. They sort of selected non-grass in the diet, which might have been um, browse, etc., um, trying to sort of plug that gap. And you can see here the digestibility, how in that year it fell away, uh, not as fast a rate as towards the end of that year. But you'll see different land types, the digestibility will drop away a lot quicker than that. And some land types, the crude protein levels uh, fall away really quickly. Okay, so managing the shortfalls. And honestly, trying to cover this um, in this short amount of time is near impossible. But I'm just going to throw options up there and maybe it might lead to some questions. But before I go there, has anybody done any diet quality assessment? Anyone in the room done, done any diet quality assessment? Rodney has. So what, what did you find, Rodney, in your situation Just the diet? Yep. Mm -hmm. Rightio. Okay, so managing, managing the dietary shortfalls. Um, and this is basically going to this in a lot more depth in an actual workshop, but what are, what are the nutrient requirements for to meet a target, whether it's a growing, young growing animal or a breeder? What's the pasture showing us? And what, and what, sorry, I've slipped by, and what, what is required to plug that gap, okay, for various nutrients. So that's, that's sort of, once we start to drill down, these are the questions that we're asking. Okay, let's just revisit some very old research, but still holds true as a basis for, for trying to plug that protein gap. So this is, this has come out of Swan's Lagoon. So it's a number of different trials that have been collated um, and looked at, and it's given us a very nice, um, I suppose, uh, relationship there. In If we look here, if we've got zero reduction in live weight loss due to supplements, we're probably not going to get any increase in pregnancy rate. But if we try and reduce live weight loss, uh, then we're going to get a response in pregnancy rate. So that was seen over and over again across different trials. So just a reminder of that because you hear things, you know, people sort of move away from the basics and, and the principles that we've been taught and the things that have been around for years. Let's not lose them. Okay, the thing is though, if you're going to plug the dietary protein gap, then you need to reduce stocking rates because the whole idea of it is that they'll eat more and when they eat more, um, then that's going to affect obviously the grazing pressure, 
And the idea of eating more is that through that they'll get more protein and energy in the diet because you, urea will stimulate the rumen microbes and that'll be the result. The other thing to remember, uh, without going into tin tacks, if you're going to feed it, then it needs to have enough protein. Sounds obvious, but balancing licks and getting it right uh, is a bigger thing than you think. If it's not right, it'll hurt you in the hip pocket. What about the source of, of protein? So, of course, if, it's, if the source is ba mainly based on urea, then that's going to be more cost effective. You hear people, people will ring up and say, oh, what about such and such a source? But it might cost three times as much. Or maybe their, their enzymes in their gut are not used to that source and might take four weeks to adapt to it. Well, they can lose a lot of weight in four weeks' time. Okay? Is the lick balanced? Seek advice. Somebody that knows that does this all the time. What's the cost per unit protein? That's a primary limiting nutrient. If you don't know that, you need to know that. Understand the analysis and how to re read a label because all of these things are important and all of these things will hit you in the hip pocket if you don't know what they are. Okay, what if there's an energy and protein problem? So very lucky in this area to have, have molasses and that's really our own option. All I want to say to this is there's a lot of recipes out there. There's a lot of different situations. It really is horses for courses. It's worth getting it right. If you're going to the effort of digging into your pocket and at the end of the day you want uh, a benefit from the cost, from the expense that, that you're putting out there, and we do this in our operation. We certainly did last year because we had to, but I expect to get results at the end of the day and I expect to get at least twice my money back. Okay. May need to, those heifers that have had a little bit of a hard time, you may need to spike feed them to get them back in calf again. What about weaning? Everyone's coming up to weaning or has already started in some areas. All I want to say from a nutritional point of view is that there's three golden rules, okay? So good quality hay for the reason I talked about before, if it's poor quality, you may not be able to physically eat it. The concentrate, a good concentrate that has been formulated to suit the level of room and development, particularly if you're going to keep them in the yard and they don't get access to pasture straight away, and the clean water, which has already been raised today. Now, surrounding that, there's a whole lot of feeding protocols. And that's going to change depending whether they're that size or that size, okay? That size or that size. But then there's the three H's, all the protocols surrounding that in terms of husbandry, health and handling. And that's another, <laughs> a whole other session. Okay. What about growth responses to supplements? In the nutrition workshop, we show a lot of graphs like this. It's information that you may not necessarily be aware of, but this was classic research that showed that with protein meals, with young cattle, you get a very high growth response at very low intake. So you really get a lot of bang for your buck. So basically, what's that te that's telling me? 0.5% of weight, then I'm going to get a lot a much higher growth response from protein meal than grain or molasses. However, we've got a problem, particularly this year, and that's the cost of protein meals. Um, so I haven't put, the, haven't put the slide up there, but basically um, the cost of protein meals in, is through the roof at the moment. So we really, we've got to go back to the molasses base, maybe with a little protein meal in it. I'll just go through these next few slides really quick because I'm running out of time um, and I'm going to get kicked off. Um, what it is, you've got a 300 kg steer from last year. You don't want to keep, you want to reach a mar target market. So what about production feeding? I'm not advocating this particularly in a year like this because I don't think the economics in it. But the reason behind it is that 
and the native pasture is just not going to do it, okay? The requirement, 88 megajoules, is too high. The native pasture is not going to do it. Feed a bit of urea, okay? It's still not going to do it. And you won't reach your target, you'll carry it over. If you hadn't fed it, it would have compensatory gain and you've done your money. So what if protein meals and grains were cheap at the moment? Maybe there's a possibility you don't want to carry that animal over, you want to spell some pasture, etc. And so you'll feed a, a production mix, it'll actually eat less grass, it's called a substitution effect. Now, we've done that with our own steers and made money out of it. Will we do that this year? I don't know. I haven't done the sums, but I'm not, I'm not confident. So, obviously, they're out, they're out. Yeah, not looking good. And I'm just going to keep going with um, some of the minerals, okay? Um, phosphorus. There's lots of reasons there why... What happens when there's not enough phosphorus in the diet? So if you haven't seen this sort of stuff for a while, there's some reminders. It's all about reproduction and growth. Not getting conceptions early in the, in the period. But the thing that's driving it all is that they don't have very good appetite when they're phosphorus deficient and there's less voluntary intake. Less conceptions in the wet season, etc. Translates to less weaners at low, lower weight weaners at the end of the day and less weaners. And, and at its worst, then you start getting clin clinical symptoms. Okay, so that's less than 35 kilometres from Mackay. I was trying not to trespass. It's a really bad paddock, but that animal had peg leg. Okay. There's some classic research. Yes, it's from Catherine on deficient country, but it just shows you the difference be between in animal performance between when they're fed and they're not fed. And phosphorus is one of those things where you really do get a return on your investment. So it can be up to four to one. Central Queensland research showed that the average size beef business on marginally deficient phosphorus country was going to make around about an extra eight grand. On um, deficient country, an extra 18, and on grossly deficient country, an extra 48 grand a year. Yes, you can look at the land type, you can look at the pastures, you can get soil samples done and you should do all that. You should look at what the animals are doing. But if you really want to know at this point in time, if you've got young cattle that have been through this last wet season and they haven't been fed phosphorus or they've only had sporadic feeding, then in the next couple of months before pasture quality does a dive, before protein levels get less than 8%, you can get this kit from DAF, Brian Barron at DAF, and you can get blood, tail blood taken, and you can see what the uh, inorganic phosphorus levels, plasma inorganic phosphorus levels were like, and you can see if they're actually deficient or not. Managing phosphorus supplementation, really this is a huge topic and it's really for a workshop. I've only put some key points up there but there's things that you need to know. Obviously, getting it into them is a big issue. You need to monitor intakes, etc. It needs to be balanced, all those things. But there's a lot of things that need to be covered off on to, to make sure that you're doing it cost-effectively as possible. Even down to knowing about the actual core phosphorus product that is being fed and the availability of phosphorus in that product. I'm going to skim over these and just let you read really quickly because I'm running out of time. But copper and selenium are also problems in this area and there's been measured deficiencies, okay? So you may have seen symptoms in cattle or heard about it, I'm not sure. Um, but obviously they just don't grow and uh, coat colour changes. You can get, you need to check, their, if that's the case, you need to check their animal status. So we're getting to welfare issues here. The same with selenium, okay? Fixing that is complex. You need to seek advice, get professional help. Right, winding down now, what's the rainfall outlook? Okay, so this is the chances of exceeding median rainfall April to June 2019. 
So we're in the white. That graph hasn't changed much today. Um, so it's about, you know, 50%. Okay, so you're probably not too worried about that. But I seem to remember a similar graph this time last year. And we were facing, we didn't realise that it was, the rain was going to cut off and it wasn't going to rain um, right into, until December. Okay, what's the chance of 100 millimetres of rain in our April? I've had, so the new, the new charts have been put up today on the bomb site, the 28th, they were due. Um, that's the old one from yesterday. Um, but today's chart doesn't look that much different to that. Um, so we, we don't really know. Hopefully we're not heading for another year like last year, but we don't really know. So the, the outlook on the bomb website yesterday was that. So it was basically saying that the chances of El Nino was triple. However, I've got good news for you that in 24 hours it's changed, okay? So it doesn't sound quite so severe, the chance of an El Nino developing. But I just urge you for the nutritional status for your hip pocket for going forward and for animal welfare that you look at the things, look, plan ahead and just think about what you're going to do if it doesn't, if things go bad. Okay. I don't even want to look at that photo. But that was November last year. It was about 39 degrees Celsius, so it's within 40 k's of Mackay. There's smoke hanging in the air, making us all nervous as hell. And unfortunately... Hopefully that was the only situation like that. Now, I wouldn't expect anyone in this room to end up in a situation like that. But as an industry, that is not acceptable. So if you see that, if you know about that, do you know the person? Is there anything, you know, I don't know, were they elderly? Were they way, what, you know, unable to do something, didn't have the money? But as an industry, we need to do something if we've got neighbours... Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is, but we, we just can't. We just can't have people driving along a public road and, and seeing that, OK? So they're somewhere between condition score one and death. Now, there was some self-destocking happening in that, unconventional destocking happening in that situation as well. So this is why we're going there with some of this nutritional stuff. Managing in dry year, just winding down to remember that we're going to have lower dry matter digestibility and that's going to be lower intakes. So yes, the nutritional status will change, wet cow to dry cow, but the feed's changing, becoming less digestible. So the intakes are going down, so we're getting a double whammy. We've got to do something about it. Last year we did NIRS in July. Reducing stocking rates get rid of some breeders that, that are not pregnant, late pregnant, haven't had a calf, faults, whatever. Plug the nutritional gap in some way if you have to, particularly if you think it's going to result in animal welfare situation. What's your mating management system? Is that right? There's more than one mating management system. In Northern Australia, the number of mating management systems, this area is more complex than Southern Australia. Find out about that. Weaning, etc., to preserve body condition, 40% drop in nutritional requirements. What are you doing this year? Do you need to wean earlier? Have we got lots of big calves on the ground at the moment? We're trying to look after the next conceptions. Okay, so we're trying to look after what what's happening in the future with our cows, try and look after the body condition. If you pull them off earlier, then you need to look after them. Okay, so there's a summary of what we've already talked about and the big one is that intakes will go down for sure. Thanks very much. Thank you, Felicity. Have we got a question in the room? Yes, we've got one in the back there. Uh, yes, you were saying before about uh, protein, oh, not protein, um, selenium, copper and uh, phosphorus. 
Now, you're saying about it in the wet season, you're saying that like uh, cows with calves or a heavy in calf need phosphorus as well in the wet season? Correct, yeah. So it is the primary limiting nutrient. Remember the barrel. In the wet season, um, protein and energy shouldn't be limiting, particularly if the grazing pressure is right. But phosphorus, if you're deficient, phosphorus is going to be limiting. So um, every kilogram of milk is a gram of phosphorus. So that's just for milk. And then there's phosphorus required for maintenance, phosphorus required for um, production, so phosphorus required to produce the next pregnancy. So, and for growth of the calf as well. Uh, and young growing animals, so but the same thing can happen with selenium as well. Now, with selenium and copper, cattle can have liver stores, so you can do a blood test, and um, the and and the blood test might show that they're deficient, but you don't get a response. But it might, they may be drawing it on on it from their liver. With phosphorus, they may be drawing on it from their bones. So she will still reproduce a good weaner. Um, but she might have drawn up to 30% of phosphorus out of her bones. She's also taken it off her back, and that's going to hurt you down the track. It's one of the, the nutrients that really has one of the highest cost benefits. Thank you, Felicity, for making um, a lot of important points there. If you wish to follow up on... Felicity's um, topic, yeah, she runs the Breeding Edge and Nutrition Edge workshops. Um, yeah, please get in touch with her um, and yeah, follow up on any questions. We better move 